Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a painter, I'm a visionary artist, um, uh, which means that, oh, hang on, wait one second, that's better, there we go. <laughs> uh, wait, where do I, I, this is, guys, there you go, tech, tech, right, <laughs> which means that um, my life, I kind of, I kind of live in the, kind of trickster around as I paint my paintings. So, um, so I'm gonna tell you about some of that process. So um, art is the realm of the imagination. I magi nation. A clue to its meaning is within the word itself. I, the magician, create my world. So art could be used as a magical tool of manifestation. You can vision what you want into being. Um, or invocation, you can call in the spirits and the divinities to like inhabit your piece of art. Um, or divination, a way to access your unconscious or um, access the astral to divine what's going on in the present and maybe what's going on in the future. Now for me, art is a dance with the mystery. It's a fantastical collaboration with the unseen. So to create is to be at one with the creator. And the creator loves to get involved in any act of creation. And in my experience, often has a very trickster-like sense of humor. So my process is totally intuitive. I follow clues and synchronicities and dreams that guide me as to which archetypal myth to work with. And um, this can be relevant both for my individual journey and the wider collective unconscious. And it can be prophetic or divinatory. And uh, as I dive into working magically with the energy, this invokes more experiences, and I end up on bizarre synchronistic adventures that unfold revealing the wisdom of the deity and usually initiating some kind of breakthrough or transformation or change of state. Um, and the experience is integrated in artistic expression um, as I formulate a design for a painting, which can also reveal many surprises on the canvas as things emerge drawn directly from the subconscious as I paint. So it's quite a surrealist uh, or magical way of working. And the Surrealist movement obviously was developed, um, influenced by the development of psychoanalysis, pioneered by Freud and Jung. And Jung identified archetypes in the collective unconscious that drives uh, behavioral patterns and used the process of alchemy as a, as a metaphorical template for shadow integration and transformation of consciousness. So his theory of synchronicity is that it's not just for entertainment, it leads to an epiphany or a psychological breakthrough of some kind. And um, so I'm going to walk you through the stories of some of my paintings as examples of this process. And uh, this, um, this one, the Magi's Grail, I, this um, actually is inspired by the tarot, inspired by the Magician card, it invokes the Magus card. Um, it's the moment when the Magician becomes empowered and picks up the four magical <laughs> elemental tools the sword, the wand, the pentacle, and the grail, and realizes that they are master of their destiny. Uh, essentially, it's about the process of creation from spirit into matter. So the fire and the star of Venus um, up above is the inspiration of spirit, and it shoots down in a lightning wand, and then all the air is breathed into the sword that the masculine holds, the water is breathed into the grail that the feminine holds, and together they're planting a pentacle in the earth, which then grows and blossoms. Um, so in that way, um, I, it could be the magus and the high priestess at the beginning of, of the tarot, or it could be the lovers in the middle of the tarot, or it could be the hermaphrodite in the world card at the end of the tarot, um, which of course is an alchemical image, the mystery of the chemical wedding of the sun and the moon, the, um, it, it's symbolizing wholeness and completion of the soul's journey. So in that way, it's the beginning, the middle, and the end, which means that I don't have to paint an entire tarot deck, which is very good. It would take me the rest of my life. And um, so I have a painting on Kabbalah, uh, an old painting, um, which features Hermes, the mercurial trickster. Um, it's about the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life, and it centers on the golden dawn of the sun in Tiberias. And um, I... I think that Hermes is actually up to his old tricks because I've had a synchronicity within this conference that I wasn't expecting um, about this painting. So it, it was actually Lizzie's first choice and um, she found it on my website and I was like, oh God, that old painting, I, 
I never promote it, it's not finished, it's from 2013. And um, I, she was like, no, no, that's the one, I really like it, can you put it on the night, night box? And um, I was like, no, no, it's, it's unfinished, so it's not worth to put on a light box. So, um, but I made a print of it, and it's, it's in my, uh, on the display downstairs. And uh, it, it was still in my mind. I was like, she's got a point. I was like, Hermes and the Golden Sun. And uh, I, anyway, I was looking in the program, and Eric was doing the keynote. Now, I met Eric years ago in London and California, about 10 years ago. And I remember having some amazing cosmic conversation and I remember following it up with an email. I couldn't remember what the email was about. So I looked yesterday morning, I was like, well, what was the last thing I said to that person? And um, there in the email, I was describing this painting. Clearly, I've been talking about it because I was painting it at the time. And um, it reminded me uh, of what inspired it that I'd actually forgotten about. And it was an ayahuasca ceremony at Terringham Hall, if anyone has been to Terringham Hall. Um, it's an incredible historical uh, place, an amazing hall with the um, Rosicrucians, I think, practiced there, the Theosophical Society, it's an incredible place. Um, Alex and Alison Gray were there at the time, and I had an intense experience. Um, I was experiencing the sphere of Tipperith. Um, all these golden dawn charts literally appeared all over the floor, and um, next thing I knew, I was being crucified, but it was ecstatic, it was orgasmic, it was like an orgasmic crucifixion. I was up on the cross and I was loving it, it was amazing, and um, it kind of blew my head off, and um, of course invoking beauty and harmony. And um, I, the funny thing is that in the email I also mentioned a book of Eric, something about Led Zeppelin, and since then, um, in the time, 10 years since, I've become very good friends with Jimmy Page's ex-wife and his youngest grown-up kids. And funnily enough, the light boxes that I was supposed to get the painting printed on live in their garden shed. And quite often, Jimmy Page's youngest son <laughs> helps me lift them into the car <laughs> when I need to go to a gig. So I thought that was really funny. I thought that was another hilarious synchronicity. I was like, Hermes, what are you up to? Um, I might actually get a light box made of that thing now. But, um, I think I got the, the message, the sign was, get back into Golden Dawn, Hermetic Kabbalah, which of course is the cornerstone of Golden Dawn magic. Um, so yeah, that's the message I'm taking from this conference. Um, now from Jewish Kabbalah, I'm going to go to Egypt, uh, if it will respond, which it, respond, go back. Okay, there you go, Egypt, Akhenaten. Um, yeah, now this painting is of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, who united Egypt in worship of the sun as a living conscious being. Um, I first met his sculpture 20 years ago in Cairo, um, and there was a presence in the sculpture. He was emanating peace. And um, so I kind of made a promise to him that I was, I was gonna paint him one day. And um, I, so you can see in the, in the water, um, there's the flower of life, and this unfolds to Metatron's cube, which is the shape around him. Within this is all the elements, which is, uh, relates to the energy bodies. So the star tetrahedron is fire, it's like the sun's rays from above his head, and um, uh, the demons that are turning to phoenixes, the transmutation quality of fire. The icosahedron is water and the emotional body. The cube is earth and the physical body. And then the air, um, I couldn't fit the dodecahedron in, is, is the mental body. And uh, uh, so th in that way, the entire piece creates a piece of sacred technology, um, which uh, uses uh, the geometry and the elements which creates harmony and is the kind of secret of creation. So it's like, it's a magical tool. Um, now, while I was painting on this, uh, I met the maestro Ernst Fuchs. And um, one of the founders of Fantastic Realism, he was a great peer and friend of Dali. And um, there's a wonderful museum of his works in the uh, Otto Wagner villa outside Vienna. And he loved that piece. And I ended up assisting and painting for him for a while. And I just want to quickly honor his influence on my work and show you his amazing painting, Under the Sign of Moses. Um, now this depicts the, the moment that God gave Moses a sign, transforming his walking stick into a snake and back again, which was a rather impressive magic trick to impress the Israelites and convince them that God is really actually quite powerful and they should listen to him. So um, that's a beautiful painting. Now um, let's go over to the Hindu pantheon. 
I had a really deep experience painting the Hindu goddess Kali. Um, this is a really good example of the trickster archetype, or maybe the creatrix. Um, I was on a pilgrimage a few years ago, and we had to design an archetypal character, or a tarot card, and mine was the creatrix. And if it was reversed, it was the creatrix, uh, spelled tricks, um, because creativity can be kind of tricksy. So now Kali is... Um, the force of time, and she pierces the veil beyond mortality, birth and death. Uh, she is the divine mother, creator and destroyer, known as the dark one, and her, her darkness is the void from which everything emerges and will return. Um, she's fierce, the destroyer of ego, uh, evil, and cuts the head off the ego, uh, symbolized by the severed head. Everyone always asks me if that's an ex-boyfriend. No, it's not. He was just sat next to me on the bus. He's the lead singer of a punk band. But, um, <laughs> so, um, so legend has it she was called into being from the forehead of Durga to defeat the demons in battle, which she did really well. Uh, but then she kept raging. So the gods were like, how can we calm Kali down? So they sent in Shiva. Um, her lover who like lay beneath her peacefully and apparently that calmed her down. So I guess this is the moment just before she calmed down. And um, my concept is that the, the spear, she's not, she's not killing him, she's piercing his heart open. Um, now the real story, what really happened is, yeah, I was on a pilgrimage that some of you know about um, uh, with some Robert Anton Wilson fans, the Cosmic Trigger crew, and we were going from St. Abbas in Dorset to CERN in Switzerland to immunitize the eschaton. And it was kind of a joke, but um, it was also magic. We were following dreams and synchronicities all the way, and we went via Dam and Her, the sacred temples of humankind in Italy. Um, on this pilgrimage, I got a lot of synchronicities about Kali, and um, I, I played her in the play that we put on at Dam and Her. Now, there were lots of scousers on the bus, as Jung had a dream, Liverpool is the pool of life, and um, we ended up at his tower in Bolladen. And this gave me an idea for a psychopomp ritual, because my grandfather died in a horrific accident just before World War II in Liverpool Bay, the Thetis submarine, um, where 100 men died. It was kind of like the Grendel of the Navy. Um, and so I had an idea. I was like, how about we do a ritual to release the souls of the men of the Thetis? And they were up for it. So, um, so I wrote a ritual. I had eight Timothy, Le um, eight scousers dressed up as Timothy Leary, and we were quoting from the, the book *The Psychedelic Experience*, and um, which is based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And so we called in the souls by the River Mersey, and we'd like guided them up to peace in this like old priory by the banks of the River Mersey. It's quite beautiful. Now, here's the trick. Um, this, a week before the ritual, I was painting this painting in the middle of the night. I didn't know this painting was about the ritual. And I suddenly had this huge, overwhelming urge to turn the painting on its side. And, come on. Oh, come back. Okay, there you go. Um, can you see, what, what do you see? Can you see the submarine? It's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, there's a submarine with a man at, at peace falling out of it. It's, um, it's a trident submarine, no less. Liverpool is where they have trident submarines. It looks a bit like a warship. And um, also, if you look closely, uh, do you remember the Beatles? Like, we all live in the yellow submarine. It kind of looks like in the centre you can clearly see a blue meanie. Now, this totally astounded me. This is a really good example of um, unconscious uh, processing. Um, all the time that I thought I was working on a painting of a Hindu deity, my unconscious was bu busy beavering away on a picture painting my dead ancestor and also managing to achieve an uncanny resemblance to a famous cartoon. So this is trickster magic at work. It's a trick, it's a joke, but there is deep wisdom. There's a huge epiphany in the center of it, right? Um, and this is exactly what the Surrealists were fascinated with. Uh, Breton was working with soldiers healing PTSD, and they were using techniques of automatism to access the subconscious, things like decalcomania, throwing paint down, and uh, seeing patterns in it, like butterfly pictures, what you see. And, um, yes, so uh, a little bit more chilled goddess. This is, um, this is Bridget. So um, my background... It's initially druidic. I grew up on Dartmoor in Devon, surrounded by stand circles and feeling the energy currents of the ley lines. And when I was really young, I joined the Order of Bards of Eights and Druids, which I'm still a member of amongst many other things. But um, 
This painting is inspired by the goddess uh, Brigid, the Celtic goddess of poetry and song and childbirth. And I was doing an invocation or prayer to her on Imbolc one year with candles in water, and I was praying for a new home, to, new home as I've been served notice. And she appeared in an apparition, and she was like, I suppose I better find you somewhere to live. And I was like, yeah, that would be really useful, very practical, helpful of you, Bridget, thank you very much. And the next day, I found a lodge with its own private silver birch woodland, which, of course, is sacred to Bridget, so she found me a grove. And uh, I went down to the woods, and I was using imprints of the, of the bark on her skin. So in this painting, you can see the... The strings of her fantastical harp are resonating in her womb and her heart, which is her connection to the universe, which is the magical cauldron from which she manifests and shoots her arrows of desire. So that's her magic. Uh, Scroll stone circle. I love that place. So um, I would like to talk about the synchronistic magical journey that I'm currently immersed in and painting about. And um, it starts again with the, the stone circles down in, down in Cornwall. Um, now, I wanted the paintings to be finished for the conference, but alas, the summer has been so crazy busy, um, they're not done yet. Um, so I'll just have to talk uh, and hint elusively at them, and I will be completing, completing them this winter and launching them next year. So um, the sequence of events started with the Menantol, the standing stones in Cornwall, known for Ithel Colquhoun's painting, Sunset Birth. Um, and uh, there's one round stone with a hole in it and two very phallic upright stones. It's a sacred site. You're meant to traditionally pass through the stones for a blessing of fertility or healing. I was near there last October when I, um, I got an email that a friend, Claudia, was suddenly stricken out of the blue and on her deathbed. So I went there to make prayers for her to live. And I went through the stone three times. And the third time I heard a voice saying, can you change the prayer, please? And I was like, oh, God, I know what you want. And um, I said, look, I'm sending you all this energy, but uh, do with it as you will. But personally, I really want you to stay. And I heard a voice saying, that's what I need. And she literally dove through the portal into a haze of golden light. It felt very blissful and peaceful. It's like she'd seen her chance for an auspicious death. I said, OK. And, um, uh, when I got back to my mother's in Devon, um, of course I got the call going, she's just gone, and I was like, yeah, I know, I, I saw that. And when I got back to my mother's in Devon, I found a Cypress journal next to my bed. I'd just been with the Cypress people, but I don't remember putting it there. Again, it was from 2013, I was like, what is that doing there? And um, I opened it, and sure enough, there was an article about the golden apples of immortality. It was about the Greek myth of Hercules on his quest for the apples of immortality in the paradise garden of Hesperides, um, freeing Prometheus on the way. Now, of course, she was the actress who played Eris in Cosmic Trigger, the play adapted from Robert Anton Wilson, and Eris is the goddess who threw the golden apples in the Greek myth, initiating the judgment of Paris. So, um, I, actually, this is, um, this is a good example of thinking about Hermes. Remember that Hermes is also a psychopomp. And um, a lot of the paintings that I do are quite often about the process of, of psychopomp work or kind of guiding souls, guiding the dead. And um, I, so the article spoke of true immortality, meaning to reawaken the divine intensity or divine fire, which ignites our enthusiasm to live well and fully for however brief a span we are physically alive, which sums my friend up in a nutshell. So I asked her partner, I said, why call? Cool. Something really cosmic happened. She doesn't live there. And he said, oh, that's going to be about her best friend, Takata Elliot, from Port Elliot, really involved with Cornwall. And I was like, OK, all right. Now, something else mysterious unfolded. I had been training with the 13 Room Mystery School, and each month uh, we journey into a different face and aspect of the goddess, seeding um, on the dark moon and celebrating on the full moon. And the night before her funeral, I was emailed the... Uh, the Sumerian myth, the descent of Inanna. Now, um, this was really synchronistic because the opening act of the play that she starred in was the enactment of the descent of Inanna, narrated by Alan Moore. Now, apparently she'd been reading a book about this just before she died. Now, the myth is a classic winter solstice descent and return myth. The queen of heaven seeks to journey down into the underworld to meet her dark sister, Ereshkigal. And um, at each of the seven gates, she is ordered to give up an item of the royal wardrobe, so her crown and her earrings and 
her necklace, her breastplate, her rod of will, her girdle, her cloak, to enter naked into the underworld. Where her sister kills her, oh, by the way, I was um, typing this the other day, literally at the very moment that the Queen died. It was another one of those really cosmic moments, it was quite spooky. Anyway, um, after three days, uh, she was rescued by efforts from her maidservant and her grandfather Enki, who's the Sumerian god of magic and crafts. And um, he sent beings down to empathize with Ashkagal, who then released uh, Anana to send and be reborn. Essentially, you can understand this myth as being about shadow integration, to use our chemical terms like Jung, it's the negrido or the blackening, uh, to go to meet and embrace the darker aspects of the self as part of the transmutation process. So we see the shadow as like, you know, the other, the dark sister, but we have to realize that the projection is also us and we are it. And um, it's also a death rite. It's letting go of layers of identity and personality, trusting the process to reveal pure spirit. And um, the next month was the alchemical goddess in the 13 Moon Mystery School, which um, was completion of the alchemical process and embracing and loving all aspects into a golden re um, return to wholeness and enlightenment. So um, I enacted this returning to the men and toll, holding a vigil all night and a rebirth at dawn. And um, now at Claudia's funeral, respond, <laughs> Magic tricks. Oh, no, no, no. Back. Okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> at Claudia's funeral, they were giving away her books, her library, and I saw one on Lucy and Freud. And I thought, well, this must be for me, because a year previously I'd sold my Sri Yantra painting to one of his sons, who also happens to be one of Sigmund Freud's grandsons. So um, uh, it was inspired by time spent at the Kumbh Mala, the epic gathering of holy babas in India, and I only found out afterwards um, that her friend from Cornwall, the friend from Cornwall, was his mother. And um, that was a bit of an epiphany. And before she died, she had just finished writing her play about her life story, and a pivotal part hinged upon her illuminating experiences at the Kumbh Mela. So that was another deep synchronicity. It was um, the painting of, of the Sri Yantra is blissful, it's a golden dawn, it's about harmony and union between Shiva and Shakti rising over the Ganga where they burn the bodies and pray. And uh, so this felt like a transmission of some kind. Um, then on the full moon, about a week later, I was reading the book on Lucy and Floyd when I read that the son who bought the painting, Francis, who was so named after the painter Francis Bacon, um, who was good friends with uh, Lucien Freud, who's a descendant of the famous Rosicrucian of the same name, and um, the, who some think that penned Shakespeare, that's a bit of a subplot. But um, this was huge for me, as it was the 23rd anniversary to the very hour of an event that happened to do with Francis Bacon that changed my life. And this was the reason that Claudia was always an important friend to me in the first place. So I wrote an art history essay eons ago about three artists, Francis Bacon, Marilyn Evans, and George Gross. And uh, I was investigating the shadow side of human nature, the politics that led to World War II, and how it can be resolved. Years later, exactly a year after my father died, who was a submarine ca captain in World War II, the whole thing seemed to prophesize events that played out, including an, an enactment of the Judgment of Paris, the Greek myth, which of course she played Eris in that play, throwing the apple, and Paris had to choose between three goddesses, Aphrodite, Hera, and uh, um, Athena. Um, of course, he chooses the hot one, Aphrodite, and is given Helen, which then starts the War of Troy. Um, I wanted to resolve the situation when it uh, can create peace, obviously. And uh, years later, when I saw the play, I was like, oh my god, it's a magical play. It's, it's that myth again. And I realized that I was somehow aligned with the same magical current as the great trickster magician author Robert Anton Wilson. Um, now, synchronistically, as I was in the middle of all of this matrix of synchronicities, if you followed me at all <laughs> last winter, um, a retrospective of Francis Bacon opened at the Royal Academy at that moment, of course, bang on cue. And then, a few weeks after that, Putin invaded Ukraine, and everyone's talking about World War III. And I'm here with this document about World War II, going, oh my god, what does this mean? Am I picking up on the collective unconscious? What am I supposed to do about it? And um, 
so I'm still, still wondering about that. But um, shortly afterwards, an exhibit on surrealism opened at the Tate, examining how surrealism was born out of a time of great conflict, and Freud and Jung were developing psychology as a response to healing PTSD. Um, and then at the British Museum, the um, exhibit opened on feminine power, um, the divine to the demonic, and exhibiting the original Sumerian tablet of Inanna, alongside, of course, statues of um, Aphrodite and Athera, um, exploring the theme of the goddesses of war and power as well as love. I went to a talk um, at the British Museum, someone introduced me to the curator, and the, someone was actually presenting a paper on Eris. So you see how the microcosm of, of the little synchronicities in my little life in our little lives, seems to be reflected in the macrocosm of what's going on in the wider collective unconscious. It comes up in culture, it comes up in art, it comes up in the museums. Um, it's really fascinating process. So um, this gets me pondering about the great eternal questions of war and peace, conflict and resolution. What is the impulse that causes conflict? How do we project darkness onto the other? Is that an illusion? How can it be transcended and resolved? And um, I think that we need the resolution of Paris. <laughs> and what's that gonna take? Um, is it gonna take some kind of overwhelming wave of cosmic love or some kind of alchemical process? Or is it gonna take some synchronistic magical trick on behalf of the great cosmic joker um, that will trigger an epiphany so that we realize that separation is the greatest illusion. And uh, I am you, you are me, we are all one. So this is the message that my trickster magician is giving me right now, and I'm painting about it at the moment, um, to be released next year. So that wraps it up. Um... <laughs> So I think I might, have, might, do we have time for one question or? One quick one, yeah. Any one burning question, who's going to be the one? <laughs> As a scouser, I grew up knowing about the thesis disaster. All oh, right. And I actually became semi-obsessed by it as a child. Oh, really? Um, you know, I was born in the 60s, it happened way before I was born. But there seems to be this like uncanny, intrinsic like desire in scousers to uh, sort of feel a united grief. And I used to lie in bed thinking about the souls of those poor men who were in the, the submarine and later on I learned about the politics that was behind the, the disaster and everything. Mm -hmm. So to, to hear you as, as a you know, granddaughter of one of those guys, that for me is a huge piece of synchronicity in itself, that I'm here today listening to your, your story and I, I was looking at your art earlier on and was you know, finding myself in, 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 in part of that. Um, so I really am um, quite sure Mm -hmm. Shocked because when you said that you went back to the, the banks of the maze and you had those scousers all dressed up and then you released the, the you know, the, you, you did the mantras to release the, the soul of the dead, I felt this overwhelming sense of relief. Like, like I'd been worrying about them all this time and now I know. It's really weird. Oh, wow. it's, it's really profound mm -hmm. to feel that, you know, and not be in some ways not associated with it in any way. But um, yeah, that's a huge piece of synchronicity as well, I think. But that's, so, that's amazing because um, I, I forgot to mention talk, talking about that. Thank you so much for that reflection. I'm so glad you're here. But um, I forgot to, it, it was with the Liverpool Arts Lab um, that, that we did it, if you um, heard of them or contacted mm -hmm. with them. And there's this, um, there's this guy called Peter. And um, yeah, at the beginning of the ritual, I didn't mention that, but his, his role was Hermes, and he had the hat and the feathers, because Hermes is a psychopomp. So he was leading the entire ritual. He was like the narrator that kind of like guided us through the whole process and introduced the Timothy Learings and everything. And we went to the Priory, had that church with all the steps, and it's got like um, a name of one of the men above every one of the steps. Yeah. And we had about 30 of us, so, so we kind of shared it out. We, we all called all of their names, and then we rang the bell and um, sent them off, and it, it, oh, I'm getting shivers so the powerful. fact that you, the mm. fact that you felt that, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you know, even as, as kids, when we were in school and stuff, we always used to talk about that. And actually, if you think about it now, the Tate Gallery is literally not that far away from, right, it, yeah. from where this incident happened, and, and it has come up in, in you know, it, 
in history classes and stuff, they, they'd often talk about it. But it's something I often find myself going back to in my 20s, 30s, 40s, like it. And then when you talked about that ceremony, it just felt like, you know, I, I can sleep now. Oh, it's just, really weird. It's, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're here. But it's very, it's very beautiful as well. And when you turn the image on its side, I was really struck. Wow. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that reflection. Come and chat to me afterwards. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you.